Welcome back. We're at Lecture 41. We are uh, probably almost literally in the middle of uh, 8.3. We will finish this section, I hope, if my uh, jaw and mouth and tongue cooperate. I went to the dentist this morning. Um, we will finish this prior to test, to our next test, which is, see, I told you it may not work exactly <laughs> like I wanted to. Probably everybody said, well, I think he went by the bar on the way to class this morning. Uh, no, uh, that's not the case. But um, we will finish this section, which is different from what the syllabus looks like. Actually, it's it's doing real well. I was really worried about 9.15 that um, I couldn't make any, you know, I could make some guttural sounds, but I couldn't form any words. So uh, it's much better. <clears throat> Just don't laugh too loud. Uh, so we are at the comparison test. Uh, actually, let's go back a half a step to the P-series. So we want to be able to shortcut this stuff. We don't want to have to reprove everything every time we come across a new series. So if we have something in this form and we've already validated some things about P-series, uh, when do series like this converge and when do they diverge? Converge when P is greater than 1 and diverge when P is less than or equal to 1. P greater than 1 converge? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Anything that we've done in class that will remind you that this is the category for convergence. We did 1 over n squared, right? We did that a couple of different ways. Uh, clearly, p larger than 1, it converges. Uh, p less than or equal to 1, well, equal to 1, we know that's the harmonic series, so that has to diverge. Uh, I think we did one also that was less than 1. Didn't we do the square root of n into the 1 half as an example? In validated that it diverges. So that's all you need to do. We've done the background work for this. You identify the one in question as a p-series. Identify what p is in the problem. Validate that it's in one category or the other. Then you write down your conclusion. You don't have to redo this every time. Uh, I think the sheets work their way around uh, class today. Let's take a, a brief look at that. Did they make it around? Yeah. Extras? Okay, just pass them up. That's convenient because you didn't get one. Uh, this was put together by Marilyn McCollum. Uh, it's, it's excellent and it's an Great summary. Sorry, I didn't um, copy. I copied it myself, so it didn't kind of, you have to flip it and turn it. Um, it's kind of the way they're presented in the book, but it might be the way you want to approach this thing as far as if you look on the uh, first page, which is has at the top summary of convergence and divergence tests. How this is going to do. But the nth term uh, basically is the, if you test it, the nth term and the nth term does not disappear, go to zero as n approaches infinity. Decision already made, it diverges. Now, what if the limit is zero? Might converge, but we need some other test that's going to tell us that. But if it is not zero for the limit of the nth term, then you work your way down the page. Geometric series, what do they look like? Uh, under what conditions do they diverge and converge? Common things to watch for, maybe a kind of a classic example over here to the right. Uh, P series, we have that one now. Integral test. Basically, if you can uh, integrate it and the integral diverges, so does the associated series. You can integrate it and it 
converges, so does the associated series. So we are at basically the bottom of this first side at this point. Now this is not something you can use on a test, but it is a nice organization of the techniques. And, and there are quite a few. You can see front and back that once we're done, there are quite a few uh, tests for convergence. So keep that handy. <coughs> we had an example yesterday. Kind of ended class with it. But here was the problem in question. We decided that if we could determine something about this series, which is a whole lot like the one in question, we could somehow compare it to the to this one, then maybe we could make a decision about the one in question based on the one that is similar to it, but is one that we know something <coughs> about. What did we decide is true about 1 over 3 to the n? That converges. Unfortunately, it's not valid if I say it converges or you say it converges, so we probably should say why it converges. Why does this one, which is very similar to the one we're trying to figure out what it does, what does, what do we know about this one? Okay, what type of series is it? Infinite geometric series. And what is the ratio in this one? I think we wrote this down yesterday in class. The ratio is one third. If you don't like the form that that's in, then that's just tough. No, we can convert it to another form. Couldn't this be one-third to the n? Right? Doesn't matter. One to the n is still going to be one. Three to the n is what we want in the bottom anyway. Doesn't that look a little bit more like an infinite geometric series? That we've got higher and higher powers of one-third, so pretty clearly the ratio is one-third. So, if the ratio is a third and it converges when the absolute value of the ratio is less than one, that's all we need, right? This is enough validation. What kind of series is it? If it's infinite geometric, what's the ratio? And is the absolute value of the ratio less than one? Therefore, all this stuff results in this conclusion. Um, now, Even in this form, although it looks more geometric, <clears throat> it doesn't look like the one that you'll see on that sheet. The one on the sheet, I'll come back to this page. So we've taken this, and we made it a little more geometric looking. <clears throat> How about the one on the sheet? Isn't it supposed to, or can't we somehow put it into this form? Right? Let's see if we can actually put this. Of the series that we said was infinite geometric, 1 over 3 to the n, what's the first term? First term is 1 third, right? So there's A. If you want to write it like that, you can. R is also 1 third. And we could raise it to the n minus 1 as long as we start n at 1 and let it run to infinity. Is that what we want? Is that 1 over 3 to the n? Probably should have brought a napkin or something. I feel like I'm going to drool all down my face here today, too. Um, that's the same one we started with. Is that correct? 1 over 3 to the n? First term is 1 third. Ratio is one third. So it is able to be converted to that kind of standard generic form. You don't have to do that, but at least it is able to be done. So if that was bothering you that this is what all geometric series look like and ours doesn't really have that look, we can make it have that look. 
All right, back to this problem. We're trying to decide about this. Does it converge or does it diverge? How is the one in question related to the one that we already know something about? Term by term. It's smaller. It's smaller. Isn't 1 over 3 to the n plus 5 less than 1 over 3 to the n? Correct? Larger denominator, smaller value. If this is true, and we know for a fact that this one converges, which we do, then the conclusion is, according to the comparison test, this is the comparison test, the one in question also converges. Reason? Comparison test. So if something is already small enough to converge, something new is smaller than the one that already converges, doesn't it make sense that it should also converge? This one is already small. I've used this inane reasoning before, so those of you that were in my class last semester. This one is already small. This one is even smaller. What is smaller than small? Isn't it also small? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does to me. If this is small and this is even smaller, this one would also be in the small category. So what's the other direction of the comparison test? What's the other side of it? Smaller than small is so-called small. What's the other end of that? How about larger than large? Isn't it also large? Sounds good? Somebody walked in the door and they're six foot six and you said, wow, they're tall. And then somebody walked in after that and they're seven foot three. You'd say, wow, they're tall too. Why? Because they're taller than the person that was already pretty tall. Taller than tall is tall. And what about if someone were, you know, like my mom, you wouldn't believe my mom was 5'3". I was taller than her in third grade. Uh, so my mom is small. So she walks in the door um, and you say, gosh, she's small. And then someone else walks in and they're four foot nine. You say, gosh, they're also small because they're smaller than my mom and she was already small. She had a quick hand though, buddy. I'm telling you, she would reach up to me and I'd say something smart and um, I felt it many times. So she was quick and, uh, but I deserved it every time. Every time she whacked me in the mouth, I deserved it. I probably deserved more than that. So smaller than small is small. So we have one that's convergent. We have one that's even smaller than that. It also converges. We have one that diverges. We have one that we know is even larger than an existing divergent series. It also diverges. Now the question is, what about if it's larger than a convergent, we can't make a decision about that. What about if it's a little bit smaller than a divergent? We can't make a decision about that. So there is an area there where this test is not good enough to make a decision. Nicole. So if 1 over 3 to the n diverged instead of con converged or whatever, and the other part was 1 over 3 to the n minus 5, would that part diverge because it was Bigger. Larger than. That's exactly okay. right. So that's the other okay. part to this test. So let's say that we had another series. I don't know if I have an example. I don't think I have one written down, so I'll just... Uh, that's not going to work. But let, let's go with this just to, to show that it's not going to work. So we would try to compare this to 1 over 2 to the n. This converges. Why? It's an infinite geometric series. The ratio is a half, which is less than 1 in absolute value.
in order to make a decision about this, we would have to know that this is smaller than the one that we already determined is convergent. Is that true? It's larger. When you subtract one from the denominator, the net value of that fraction is in fact larger than this, right? If you want to make a fraction smaller, you make its denominator larger. If you make the denominator larger, you have in, instead gone the other direction. You've made the value of the fraction larger. So this is not true. Therefore, there is no decision in the comparison test. So the comparison test, test fails to give us a conclusion here. Now there's one that's very similar that we're a few minutes away from discovering as well called the limit comparison test, but just the good old fashioned comparison test isn't good enough to tell us what this one does. What, what would your guess be? If this one converges, don't you think this one also converges? But this test isn't good enough to tell us that. So we'd have to get another test. So let's say, so we can get an example, what is one that we know diverges? One over n. I'm going to start this at uh, two, for obvious reasons. I think when I work my way back over here. Because I've got to start this one at two, otherwise I'm in trouble, right? In the denominator with a zero. So we know for a fact that this one diverges. All we need to say is it's harmonic. We've already kind of validated that a couple of different ways. What about 1 over n minus 1 compared to 1 over n? Well, by subtracting 1 from the denominator, we made it larger. This one is already divergent. This one, term by term, is larger. Therefore, this one must also diverge. by the comparison test. So smaller than an existing convergent series also converges. Larger than an existing divergent series also diverges. Any other decision we try to make is not, this test isn't going to work for us. All right, well, let's go back to this one where the regular comparison test failed. Let's go to a test that's similar in, in as far as the, the name of it and, in a sense, the kind of the nature of our conclusion. But we want to see, since the kind of the baseline or simpler comparison test failed, let's try what's called a limit comparison test. I think you'll see this on the sheet. Uh, this is actually on the back side of the sheet, so we're, we're getting there. We don't have to be concerned about which one is in the numerator and which one is in the denominator. We're going to have the one in question. You can call it a sub n or b sub n. It doesn't matter. And then the one that we think is similar to it, give it whatever name you want to call it, a sub n or b sub n. This is the one we know something about. 
So this is known to be convergent. The one in question, we tried to use the comparison test. We kind of went through that. It's not going to work because this term by term is not smaller, but in fact a little bit larger. But we have an idea that it also converges. So we'll take a limit of the one in question over, and you can transpose this. doesn't matter which one you put in the numerator, which one you put in the denominator, over the one that we know something about. And we're really only concerned way out to the right what happens as we compare these two. Now let's go through what might happen. Let's say that we get a limit of 1. I don't know what we're going to get, but let's say we get a limit of 1. Doesn't that mean that way out to the right there's practically no difference between the 1 in the numerator and the 1 in the denominator? Is that what that means? If the limit is 1, numerator and denominator are practically the same? What if it's 3? That means the numerator is 3 times the size of the denominator. This one already converges. Does that mean this one would also converge? Yeah. Just converges to a number that's 3 times as large as this one. So no matter what you get, as long as you get a limit, could be 11 or 17. They both do the same thing. So if we know this one converges and we get a limit of 1 or 3 or 11 or 17, this one also converges. Or 1 11th or 1 17th. So if you get an answer, they both do the same thing. So if we're dividing by that one, we'll multiply by its reciprocal. I don't know. What do you want to do to get a solution on that? A couple of different ways. It's not a mystery that 2 to the n and 2 to the n is not going to be a whole lot different when you get way out there to the right. What's the difference between 2 to the 1,000th and 2 to the 1,000th minus 1? It's not going to matter too much, is it? If you had $600 trillion and you dropped one, would you bother bending over to pick it up? Probably not. So the numerator and denominator are about the same. But let's actually kind of validate that. How about if we divided through by... 2 to the n. What happens to this 1 over 2 to the n term as n approaches infinity? Disappears. So the limit is 1. That means the numerator is practically the same series as the denominator. So if the one in the denominator converges, the one in the numerator also converges. That's exactly right. If it's 100, that's fine. It still converges. It just converges to a number in all probability that's about 100 times as large. So in this case, they both converge. because the one that we knew something about converges, the one in question does the same thing if you get an answer for the limit problem. Now, what, when would this test fail? I mean, they all kind of have bounds when they work and when they don't work. Can you think of what could happen here that would cause this test to fail? Okay, how about equal to zero? What if this were equal to zero? That means that the numerator is a whole lot smaller than the denominator. If this already converged, wouldn't that converge even more rapidly? Right? Possibly. 
How about if the we didn't get a limit? The limit does not exist. Well, if the limit does not exist, we can't say they both converge or both diverge. We don't make a decision on that one. So we do want to get an answer to the limit problem. Does not exist is not really technically an answer. So in this case, if we know the, the one we know something about, Chandler, question? Um, did you say it mattered where you put the known and the unknown? On top or on bottom? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, in, in this problem, it clearly wouldn't matter because it was one. We'd right. still get one over one. Okay. Uh, in a problem where it's not one, let's say it's one third, then that would mean the denominator is three times as large as the numerator. If you transpose that, you get the numerator being three times as large as the denominator. It doesn't matter. So it's just like a, a ratio, I guess. Right. It's a ratio of the one in question to the one that we know something about, put either one in either position, numerator or denominator. Now, it does say where the answer is finite and greater than zero. In the convergence case, zero probably would mean that they would both converge. I think that would be problematic in the divergence because zero times the divergence, that, that could be problematic. So let's just throw zero out. We don't want to get zero either. That's another way this test could fail. We want to get something, some number other than zero, and we certainly don't want the limit to not exist. What's this one do? 1 over 3 to the n. Converges. Infinite geometric series. The ratio is the third, which is less than 1 in absolute value. Here's one that looks a whole lot like it. You have to decide, am I going to be able to use the comparison test, or do I need to use the limit comparison test? What would make that decision for you here? Comparison. Because if we add something to the denominator, don't we make it smaller? Right? This one's convergent. This one, term by term, is even smaller. So the regular comparison test is going to work here. The regular comparison test is not going to work here. But we still have a pretty good idea because this one looks a whole lot like this one. This one converges. We have a good idea. This one's also going to converge. So we would kind of skip the comparison test and go right to the limit comparison test. And see what happens way out to the right. And we're going to get probably one again, right? Which means that if this one converges, so does this one. So it's a little more sensitive of a test, I guess. It's going to pick up more values than the, just the straightforward comparison test. A little bigger net. Um, I should have started class with this today, but it actually just came to my mind. I had a couple of questions at the end of class yesterday, and I, I know what we have yet to do in this section. And it would probably be a good thing to address that question that came up right after class yesterday. Um, let's see if I can. The first one was one over n squared, which we now know that converges because it's a p series and p is larger than one. So we had a picture
and actually a couple people had the same question after class, so there may have been more of you that had this question that didn't ask it in class yesterday. Um, let's write out the first few terms of this series. The first term would be 1 and then 1 over 2 squared, 1 over 3 squared, 1 over 4 squared. So we know it converges. <coughs> This is when we were doing the integral test. We also integrated 1 over x squared from 1 to infinity. The first term I'm going to write what I wrote yesterday and then I'll address the question that came up after class. I wrote the first term of this series out here which is 1 that block is one wide and one tall. Here should be the second term. The f of 2, if you come up to the curve itself, well the curve is 1 over x squared, so it would be 1 over 2 squared, which is 1 fourth. So that's one wide and 1 fourth tall. So there's the second term. This is 1 ninth tall and 1 wide so we actually started the integration at 1. That's where this starts. And we said because the integral, 1 over x squared, from 1 to infinity, converged, that the series associated with it, even though it didn't capture all the boxes, we had an extra box of area 1, So we kind of wrote this out to the side and said we're going to add in that one block or box to what we get for the area under the curve. I think we also got one for this, if I remember correctly. The important thing is because this converged, the series associated with it also converged. If the integral converges, so does the series by the integral test. Somebody brought up the question, well, why didn't you just, instead of having this one by one block out here by itself, why didn't you move everything over to the right by one? Did not what the, that was the question yeah, that came up? It was in relation to the other problem, the one over. Okay, and we'll do that but, one too, yeah, because it makes thing. sense based on what we have yet to finish in this section that we see why that, although it's plausible idea why it's we don't want to do that. So the rationale is we're able to find the area under this curve because it converged. Therefore, we should be able to add 1 fourth to 1 ninth to 1 sixteenth to 1 over 25. It's underneath the curve. If the area under the curve itself converged, certainly the area of the blocks underneath the curve that didn't even make it up to the top, we've got some missing pieces. They will also converge, and then we, we're missing one. We'll just add it back in. That's not going to change convergence or divergence. So the question came up, why not come out here to 1? Why don't we just shift everything over? So instead of having this one by one block out here by itself, why don't we draw the one by one block right here? There's that block. We're just going to shift it over to here. This block, the one fourth block, we're going to shift over to here. The next block. Why do we not want to do that? Because we're over the curve. Under the curve, yes, that converged, but we're adding some onto that now. Does that maybe take something that was convergent? We add a little triangle on each of these. Now, could it possibly diverge? That's possible. So that's back to the, this is convergent, therefore this is small. We want to stay smaller than small, right? We don't want to be larger than small. We don't know what that means. My mom's 5'3". Someone walks in that's taller than her. Does that all of a sudden make them tall? No, they could be 5'4". Five, 5'3 five, and an eighth. Okay? 
larger than small doesn't make you large. That's what we want to steer clear of. So that's why we have to take this as it is. Even though we don't capture the one by one block, that's fine. We can add it on at the end. Let's take all the rest of the terms. As long as they stay under the convergent curve, that means the series is convergent. The other question or issue was, what was that curve? Just one over n? This one we know diverges. The integral associated with it also diverges, which that's kind of the basis of the integral test. So if this one's already in trouble and is divergent, what do we want to happen? with the blocks that we kind of associate with this particular diagram. We don't want them to come underneath the curve. That'd be smaller than large. I don't know what smaller than large is. Might be small, might be large, might be medium. We don't have a medium category. So we want to do what with the blocks that we put in here? Could we put them over here? Put the one by one block here? We could. We, I mean, we get to draw them wherever we want to draw them. So we could draw them over here. Why would we not want to do that? Well, if we put the one by one block there, and we start our area right here. Then the next block is what? One wide and one half tall. Now we've got both of these. The next one is one wide and one third tall. Now we've got a problem because this area was divergent. Now we're underneath that. We're missing some pieces. Does that take what was divergent and possibly make it convergent? We don't know. So what would be a better picture than this is the picture that we actually did yesterday. Why don't we take our one by one block here, our one half by one block here, and our one third by one block over here. Now we can all of a sudden make a conclusion because what? This was divergent. Now we've got even more than that. It must also diverge. Does that make sense? So in case you had that same question but didn't, stay after class yesterday to address that. That's why we want the figure to look like this and not like this. No conclusion can be made here. We can make a conclusion here. Same thing with the other diagram. Um, we can start it, but I don't think we can finish this. <coughs> Let's say we have an infinite series, and, but we don't let it run to infinity because it's, we can't physically write them all out and there's no other shortcut to getting the sum. We don't have an infinite geometric series, so we can't find the sum. But we know it's a convergent series. We want to approximate the sum. So maybe we add the first 10 terms or the first 20 terms or one example in the book talks about adding the first 100 terms of the series together. You probably would expect a pretty high level of accuracy if you added the first 100 terms of a series together. But it's not going to be exact because you're missing some. You're missing all the ones beyond the 10th term or beyond the 100th term. So when we do stop and have a finite number of terms, S is the sum of all terms, S sub n is the sum of n terms. Obviously, there's a difference. It's 
So just for notation purposes, the authors address this, the difference between the sum of all the terms and the sum of what we find, the first 10 or the first 30 or the first 100, is the remainder associated with the sum of the first n terms. So that's R sub n. So these diagrams are related, I, I think you'll see, to what we just looked at in terms of how we draw the figure. So we want to know kind of an upper bound for the remainder, or error, and a lower bound. We're not going to be able to, if we, if we have the sum of the first 10 terms and we could find the exact error, then we'd be able to add it or subtract it to our sum and we'd have the exact sum. Well, we're not going to be able to get the exact error. We're going to get an upper bound, something out here, and a lower bound. So our error or remainder is somewhere in that vicinity, so we know kind of how bad we are. We're really most of the time concerned with this one. How far off are we in terms of being away from the exact sum? Here's our first picture that we want to look at. So we want to categorize this remainder or this error. <clears throat> Let's kind of start with this and see if the picture makes sense. Let's pick up where we left off. So we're leaving off at n. So we found the sum of the first n terms. And we have an answer for that. Add term 1 to term 2 to term 3 all the way up to term 10. So we have the sum of the first 10 terms. So we're stopping at 10. We're stopping at n. What are we missing? Well, we're missing, the first term we're missing is the n plus first term. So we come over to n plus 1. We go up to the curve. This is the curve that basically is the same function as the descriptor of the series itself. Then we would add in the next term. We're not going to. These are just the terms we're missing. And so on. Is it possible to find the area under the curve all the way out to infinity? It is. It, not in, in all cases, but if it is, we take the area under the curve from n, which is where we left off, all the way out to infinity. Isn't that more than the terms we're actually missing? Here's the area under the curve, this whole thing. There's what we're really missing, this block, this block, this block, and this block. So isn't the area under the curve from n to infinity actually more than the terms we're missing? It is, because we've got these little things that are area under the curve. We don't even care about them. They're not terms in this series. So is it true that the area under the curve, f of x, integrated with respect to x from n, which is where we left off, all the way to infinity, that area is more than what we're really missing. Is that correct? We're missing the blocks. The area under the curve is actually more than the blocks. So there's our upper bound for our error. So it's the remainder or the error is bounded above by the area under the curve from n, which is where we left off, all the way to infinity. The other side of this I think you can see why I wanted us to go back and look at the other situation. It's very similar to this. The other end of this, what's the lower bound for this remainder? Well, now instead of starting at n, why don't we go over one place, whatever n was. We stopped at 10. We added the first 10 terms together. Well, let's go over to 11. Let's go over to the n plus first term. So we come over here to n plus 1 come up to the curve, there's the n plus first term that we are missing. 
there's the n plus second term that we're missing. There's the n plus third term that we're missing. So can we go from n plus 1 all the way out to infinity and capture kind of a lower bound for the remainder or the error? Well, kind of, but didn't we miss some? Right? Isn't the blocks, the sum of the blocks that we missed, it's actually more than the area under the curve. So it's a lower bound for the remainder or error estimate because really there's, there's more to it than just the area under the curve. We're missing these little triangular shapes as well. So there's our lower bound. We'll start with this next page tomorrow, but let me put these two together. So there's our upper bound for the remainder, or error. There's our lower bound. So the actual error, the terms that we missed by stopping at n equals 10 or n equals 100, is actually somewhere between there. Neither one of them captured it exactly. One, we were underneath the curve. We were missing some of the error. The other, we were above the curve and we had too much. So it's actually somewhere in between. So we'll start with this tomorrow and then we'll look at a couple of examples of how we can stop at the 10th term, figure out how far our answer might be from the actual sum. <laughs>